Five minutes, honey. I'm ready. Been ready for hours. Oh, you haven't seen Mr. Humboldt around, have you? I've been looking all over the theater for him. What's the trouble? Won't the sheriff let us open that night? Oh, sure, sure. I got that all straightened out. No, I was just looking for the boss, that's all. Always looking for the boss. Always chasing after him and picking up for him. What do you get for it? Oh, honey. Oh, it makes me sick the way you take care of that windbag. Like he was a slave or something. You ain't married to me anymore. You're married to him. Okay, will you quit saying that all the time? Look, I'm the manager of the show, ain't I? I gotta take care of things. What things, George? Oh, Mr. Humboldt, sir. What seems to be the trouble? You know there's never any trouble with the Humboldt Productions. That's been the secret of my success. No matter what town we're playing, no matter how small the audience, we always give a show. Look, Mr. Humboldt, I've uh, got a letter for you. I think maybe we better go back to your office. Well, you leave it in there, George. I'll be with you in a few minutes. Well, Kay, how's my favorite leading lady? Hmm, some favorite. The last time you seen my act was in 1946. Why don't you sit out front and look at your own show sometime? Maybe you'd part with a few bucks. Make it a little better. Now, you know, we never spare any expense when it comes to the Humboldt Productions. We give our shows exactly as they're given in New York, only we don't charge New York prices. But as far as the production is concerned... Uh, Mr. Humboldt, I think you better read this letter right away. I'll read it later, George. But it's from the Internal Revenue Service, sir. Oh, really? I wonder what they could want from me. Excuse me, Kay. Come on, George, we'll see what this is all about. The deliberate and willful falsification of income tax returns is a more serious crime than some people seem to realize. To misrepresent earnings or to make fraudulent deductions in an effort to pay less taxes is a felony punishable by a term of from one to five years in the federal penitentiary. I say that not as a threat, but as a warning to those who fail to realize the importance of their obligations to the government and almost consider it a common practice to cheat. And now in my role as chief of the Intelligence Division, Internal Revenue Service, I'm going to tell you about just such a person. A man who had to learn the hard way that honesty is the best policy. This is Treasury File 4982, Internal Revenue Service. The case of the slippery eel. It's remarkable. It's remarkable what little faith the government has in me. They still won't take my word for those income tax returns from 1948 on. Why? Now, what do they say this time? Just about what you suspected. Unless I give them certain information, they'll subpoena my books. I knew it. Sooner or later, I knew this was going oh, to happen. stop fluttering, George. They're only mad because I didn't answer their last letter. But you haven't answered their last three letters, Mr. Humboldt. Oh, they know you're stalling them. I object to your use of the word stalling, George. It has an unsavory connotation, as if we had something to hide. Well, haven't we? Not in my opinion, no. Then why don't you want him to examine your book? Oh, don't be rude, George. You know as well as I do. The only way to deal with people who are after money is to be as uncooperative as you possibly can, especially the income tax people. After all, they're only human. You put enough obstacles in their way, sooner or later they'll stop bothering you. They haven't stopped yet, Mr. Humboldt. Nor have I. Forty years in show business. As far as I'm concerned, it's all a ballyhoo, George. A succession of one-night stands, unpaid hotel bills, dodging process service. You know, the older I get, the less I fear people with badges. What are you going to do about that letter, Mr. Humboldt? If they subpoena your books, we'll all be... Will you stop worrying, George? How can they subpoena books that don't exist? What do you mean? You, you can't tell them that uh, you didn't keep any records. <laughs> I kept records all right. But somehow or other, they were all lost. As a matter of fact, they were destroyed in a fire. In a... F Don't you remember, George? The fire that nearly wiped us out when we were playing Springfield two years ago? I remember. It destroyed every record we ever had.
That's the trouble, Chief. These shows of his travel all over the country, and this man Humboldt's like an eel. Every time you try to pin him down, try to make an appointment with him, he manages to wriggle away from you. And he still hasn't answered any of your letters. Oh, he answered our last one, after we threatened to subpoena his books. But he stalled us for eight weeks. Claims he never received our other letters. And what was his answer to the last one? <laughs> the old story. Fire destroyed his books. Oh. Well, I certainly wouldn't waste any more time corresponding with him, Blaine. The only way to handle a man like that is on the spot. Have you any idea how much we'd be likely to recover? Well, my original estimate was twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000. But if a man puts up this much of a struggle, it's probably a lot more. All right, Blaine, go to it. There's going to be a slow night, honey. Hardly any advance sale at all. Mm, so what are you beating your brains out for? You think you'll get any thanks for it from Humboldt? Oh, honey. You know, Penny Pension won't even buy me a new costume for the first act finale. It's almost ten years old. I wore it for him in three shows before this. Look, Kay, it's uh, getting kind of late. Don't you think maybe you better go backstage and... Oh, tickets for tonight, mister? I think I can give you some choice seats in the orchestra. Uh, no, I'm not here to see the show. I'm here to see Mr. Humboldt. Do you know where I can find him? Well, uh, that all depends. What do you want to see him about? It's a personal matter. Uh, we're all kind of busy right now. Couldn't it wait till later, maybe? I'm afraid not. I'm from the Internal Revenue Service. United States Treasury Department. Good. I beg your pardon? It's Kay. He's right in there, mister. Just come around to the manager's office. If you've got anything on Humboldt, give it to him good. Gall, that's what you've got, Mr. Blaine. Plain, unmitigated gall. You've got no right to come out here without any notice, barging into my office like this. I don't care if you are from the Treasury Department. You've got no right to bother me with books and accounts and fires at a time like this. Well, I've got a show to put on. Well, I'm in no particular hurry, Mr. Humboldt. I'll wait. Well, you'll have a long wait. You better turn around and go back where you came from. I've come a long way in order to see you, Mr. Humboldt. I'll wait. Yeah. I can't see you now, and that's all. There you are, Guido. That'll do till tonight. I'll be busy after the show, too. Well, when can I see you, Mr. Humboldt? How about the first thing tomorrow? Tomorrow? No, that's a bad day. I'll be busy with transportation schedules right up to showtime. There must be some time when I can see you. Uh, Monday. Monday morning at 10 o'clock. I'll be here sharp at 10. You'd better see me tonight, Mr. Humboldt. Monday morning at 10 o'clock, this show will be in Davenport. Night, kids. Nice show tonight. Thanks, Kay. Take care of yourselves now and get some sleep. We're breaking in that new routine on the matinee tomorrow. We'll be there. Night, girls. Good night. Look, Kay, uh... You'll have to go back to the hotel alone tonight. I got to stick around the office with Mr. Humboldt and that guy from the Treasury Department again. He's got the old man over a barrel. Well, what should you care? The old man never did anything for you. Why should you care what happens to him? What happens to him happens to all of us, doesn't it? If he gets nailed on an income tax wrap, this whole company will fold up just like that. Will it? Sure it will. Why can't you take over Humboldt Productions? You can run these shows as good as he can. Better, maybe. Ah, you're dreaming, Kay. Well, why not? It's about time we owned a hunk of this outfit. How much more singing and dancing do you think I'm good for? What about you? After all these years playing nursemaid to that phony, you deserve something decent. So that's why you're out to get the old man. I always knew you wanted to knife him for some reason, but... I could never figure out why. Yeah. You used to be kind of sweet on him before you and me got hitched. Maybe I was too sweet. Yeah. Well, there's no time for revenge, Kay. Go on home, huh? Now, about these deductions for depreciation and abandonment, Mr. Humboldt. According to your return for 1948, you deducted $8,000 for depreciation on 12 platforms, 16 parallels, border lights, and a prefabricated water tank. You also made a deduction for abandoning four mules and a tableau float which you used in a parade for publicity purposes. Oh, possibly. I told you I can't remember all the details. 
Well, when you abandoned the mules, for example, just exactly what did you do with them? Did you have them destroyed? Did you uh, give them to a farmer? Or did you sell them to a glue factory? How do I know what I did with the filthy things? If they were so dirty, I wouldn't go near them. But, Mr. Humboldt, if you claim a deduction of $350, I have to know whether or not you sold them. And if you did, how much you got for them. I also have to know what you paid for them originally and whether or not there was a profit. Oh, still at it, huh? Yep. Still George, in heaven's name, what did we do with the four mules that we used in the Western musical we did? This man's driving me insane. Mules? I don't remember buying any mules. You didn't buy them, George. I did. But you got rid of them for me. He wants to know how much you got paid for them. Oh, well, uh, I, I couldn't say, sir. I, I just don't remember. Well, I don't blame you. This time of night, I can't remember my own name. Well, if you're tired, Mr. Humboldt, we can continue this tomorrow. What's the use of continuing? I've told you a dozen times that all the records have been destroyed. Now, what can you prove by asking all these stupid questions? It isn't what I can prove, Mr. Humboldt. It's what you can prove. After all, you made the deductions. It's up to you to substantiate. Is that so? Let me tell you something. Every statement I made in my income tax returns have been sworn to. I insist they're bona fide. Now, if you want to prove I'm a liar, you go right ahead. I'm only trying to get to the facts, Mr. Humboldt. But if you refuse to cooperate... I won't have you call me a liar. Now, get out of here. I'm tired. All right. That's the way you want it, Mr. Humboldt. That's the way it'll have to be. Really, Blaine? He actually had the nerve to ask you to get out of his office? Well, if he has no records and he refuses to cooperate, we're going to have to go after him with everything we've got. Now, what about that woman you were telling me about, the one who seems to be out for Humboldt's scalp? Well, I think she's going to be very helpful, Chief. She's been in practically all of his productions. She should have plenty of information. Yes, her husband's the manager of the company. Well, work that angle. And make yourself conspicuous, Blaine. If you keep on investigating right under his nose, you may get him to tip his hand. And he's over at the theater again, Mr. Humboldt. I can't get rid of him. He hung on like this in Springfield, uh, Davenport, Des Moines, and now it's the same thing here. Three times already he's been backstage talking to Kay, asking questions. We've got to stop it, George. Every time she talks with that treasury man, he finds out something new. Where we get our tickets, how much we pay for our costumes, how much it costs to put up a set. The man's a maniac, always digging up information from everybody all day long. I don't think he has to dig it out of K, Mr. Humboldt. She's just telling him everything she knows. Confound it, George. Can't you shut her up? Well, I... You know what will happen if they ever find out those deductions are phony? I'll have to pay them. I'll have to pawn everything I own. Even that won't be enough. I might lose the show. I might even have to go to jail. Jail? If they'd send you... What do you think they'd do? Pat me on the head and tell me not to jip them anymore? Oh, no, oh, but shut I... up. For 20 years, I've kept this rattletrap business going with spit and old pieces of string. Skinning theater owners, dodging process servers, one jump ahead of the sheriff. Sure, it's been a rat race. Shortchanging Hicks is a stinking way to make a living. But it's my life. The only one I've ever known. I'm not going to be dumb out of it. Uh, wait a minute, Mr. Humboldt. Where are you going? I'm going down to your hotel room and I'll shut Kay's mouth if it's the last thing I ever do. Sure. Sure, that treasury guy was up to see me just a little while ago. So what business is it for yours? Maybe I feel like talking to him. Kind of he's after you. Well, now, that's no way to talk about an old friend of yours, Kay. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for you. I was always sorry when you chose George instead of me. You are gonna play music with this? Perhaps I ought to play music. Soft music. What you're doing to me is worse than what Brutus did to Caesar. You're destroying an old man, Kay. Crushing him, willfully. How many people have you crushed? How many times have you given your own performers a raw deal? To say nothing of the farmers and hotel managers and railroad men, you skin. Well, whatever I did, I did without malice, and that's what I can't understand about you. Do you want to see me go to jail? Do you want to see me behind bars begging for bread and water? 
What have I ever done to you to deserve all this? Plenty. Now, Kay, whether you know it or not, every time you talk to that treasury man, you give him a new lead. Not that we have anything to hide, especially. Who are you kidding? That treasury guy has got your number, but good. What do you mean? All those deductions you've been taking. You think he don't know what the score is? I mean... What did you tell him, Kay? What did you tell him? Get your hands off me. Get your hands off me or I'll dig your eyes out. I don't know what you told him. I told him what a dream boy you were. How you picked me up in Kansas. Made me fall in love with you. You promised to get me into the movies. How you got me to run away from home and my family so I could go to work for you. For buttons in that ratty little burlesque show you were doing then. How you kept stringing me along for years while I was eating my heart out till you got tired of me and dumped me for that striptease artist from Jersey. That all you told him? Wouldn't you like to know? Ah, you're bluffing. Am I? Ask him about the fire we had. The one that burned up all your books. What do you mean? Go ahead, ask him. He knows we didn't have any fire. He knows we didn't have any publicity parades or prefabricated water tanks or floats or a lot of other things you deducted for. Go on, try it. Just try it. I didn't think she'd go that far, Mr. Humboldt. I told her not to say anything to that guy. I told her she'd only make trouble. Make trouble, all right. And she's going to make more. Perhaps enough to get even with me. I'm sorry, Mr. Humboldt. No, it's my own fault, George. You step on enough people, sooner or later, one of them's going to turn around and step on you. You know, perhaps I've been wrong all my life. Maybe life isn't the shell game I suppose it to be. No? What is it, then? Oh, for people like me, perhaps nothing. It's the suckers who really get something out of their lives. Not people like me. After all, honesty is the best policy. For you, Mr. Humboldt? For everybody, George. Everybody. You know, I've just made a great decision. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Make a clean breast of everything. I'm going to go to that treasury man and tell him the whole truth, even if I have to go to the chair for it. Uh, but... Now, don't Mr. try Humboldt. to dissuade me, George. I've made up my mind to be an honest man. Make my life an open book. Open book. That's it, George. An open book. What a fool I've been. Instead of fighting him, we sort of taken him into our camp and cooperated with him. Shown him our books. How? With your books, you can't afford to cooperate with anybody. That's but... just it, George. We won't show him the old books. We'll make up a set of new ones, and we'll phone them up right this time. He won't be able to prove anything. Oh, but th that's a big job, Mr. Humboldt, making out new books. I it'll take weeks. I don't care how long it takes. We'll be laying off here for two weeks anyway. Yeah. Oh, but you already told that treasury guy your books were destroyed. Ah, never mind what I told him. I honestly thought they were destroyed in the fire. Suddenly, one day, I opened up an old trunk. And there they were. Right at the bottom of it. Oh, for crying out loud, George. Are you go in the Humboldt's hotel room again tonight? That makes the fourth time this week. Sorry, honey, but I got a job to do for the old man. But we got to get it done fast. See you later, huh? Oh, oh, sorry. Keep at it, George. Keep at it. I can't stall that treasury man off much longer. We have to be done by Friday. Are you sure? Are you sure these are Humboldt's original books, Mrs. Pendleton? Oh, they is, I tell you. I wouldn't have brought you over here if they weren't. My husband's been checking them or something every night for the last two weeks. Here? Oh, sometimes here, sometimes at the office. What difference does it make, as long as they're the real McCoy? It doesn't if they're the real books. 
And I'll be able to prove that in a very short while. How do you mean? By a strange coincidence, Mr. Humboldt called me this afternoon. Said he had a big surprise for me. His books. What? Yes, I'm going over to examine them now. He said he found them at the bottom of an old trunk. And there they were, right in the bottom of an old trunk. Among some old programs and two sheets and things. I see. <laughs> you can't imagine how surprised I was when I saw them. I couldn't believe my eyes. And you know the first thing I thought when I did see them? What did you think, Mr. Humboldt? I said, Humboldt, you've been a stubborn mule all the time you've had those records. And you let that poor treasury man break his back getting information that was already in the books. Yes, sir. I felt so much like a fool I could have kicked myself. The first thing you did was to call me, huh, Mr. Humboldt? Why, naturally. I have no intention of keeping anything from you. As an honest man, I want to act in good faith. So I act in good faith now. Mr. Blaine, the books are yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Humboldt. These will make an invaluable addition to the collection I already have. Collection? You have some other books there? Yes. They belong to a man by the name of Humboldt. Another man with the name of Humboldt? No, not another man. Another set of books. I, uh, I don't follow you. I don't think it should be too difficult to understand, Mr. Humboldt. After all, two sets of books, two sets of figures. Incidentally, I've been going over some of the figures in your original books. They're very interesting. Yeah. Jacked up purchases, double rates of depreciation, abandonment claims for property that never existed. I think we have a pretty good case, don't you? Now, Mr. Blaine, you're making a very grievous mistake. Kay Pendleton has been telling you some stories about me. Fairy tales. Mr. Humboldt, these are hardly fairy tales. Oh, I didn't know we had two sets of books. I don't keep my accounts. George Pendleton does that. Don't you understand? That's why Mrs. Pendleton is trying to protect him and telling you those lies. He's the thief, not me. <laughs> Who's the thief? What are you talking about, Mr. Humboldt? George, we've been very old friends for many years. And I've trusted you implicitly. But there is one thing that I cannot tolerate. That is dishonesty. You've kept two sets of books, George. One for yourself and one for me. All the time, you've been robbing my company for your own gain. Shamelessly robbing a nearsighted old man. Well, you, you dirty double-crosser. Well, you've got an eye like an eagle. You're the one that got me into this. You made me make out these books. Uh, now, don't you awe me, Mr. Humboldt. Not after all I've done for you. Uh, George. All these years, I've done your dirty work. I've lied for you, covered for you. Yes, I've even cheated for you. But I'll be hanged if I'm going to jail for you. Yes, he's got two sets of books, all right. Both of them phony. Everything about him's phony, and I'm fed up with it. You want a witness for the government, mister? I'm in. Now, George, now you can't do this to me after all we've been to each other. We've been like brothers. Now, you tell this man what you're telling him is lies. I never stole anything from anybody at any time. You tell him, Mr. Humboldt. I can't tell that big a lie. I... Avery Humboldt who insisted to the bitter end that his own business manager, George Pendleton, had kept two sets of books in order to swindle him, was brought to trial for attempting to evade the payment of income taxes of almost $76,000 and was convicted on all counts. He was sentenced to two years in a federal penitentiary and $60,000 was recovered for the government in penalties and back taxes. No action was taken against George Pendleton who testified at the trial for the government and helped to bring a very slippery eel to justice.